in the realm of the blue sun, entering the world of weightlessness. Floating freely in an endless ocean like a fish has been a dream of mankind since the beginning of time. A dangerous realm, the habitat of fascinating creatures which even today are still mysterious. A realm of beauty and variety with infinite colors and shapes. In the realm of the deep, discovering another world. Extraordinary team starts out. The free divers, Frederick Bouy, William Winram, Pierre Fourla, and the underwater cameraman Christian Petron want to show the world that they can approach the inhabitants of the oceans nearer than anyone ever before. Their equipment is just a diver's mask and flippers, no diving tanks and safety cages. These divers trust the inhabitants of the deep to accept a peaceful visit to their realm. journey around the world begins. It leads them to the coast of Mexico, to the hunting ground of the great white shark. The expedition continues to the unknown beaches of the Pacific islands of French Polynesia, a world where miniature islands are lost in the endless blue ocean. The team starts its journey to the wrecks of sunken ships and hidden underwater caves in the Mediterranean. Free divers can venture into the realm of the deep anywhere in the world. In my opinion, free diving is the best way to explore the underwater world. Because when you free dive, you don't have a lot of equipment, you don't have the tanks, you don't make bubbles you're silent, you don't make any noise. So that allows you to follow the fish, to observe the fish, and to see things you will never be able to observe in another kind of diving. And that's the big advantage of free diving. But this floating effortlessness made possible by water has long been unreachable for humans. Diving technology allows them to remain under the water longer and deeper, but all the heavy equipment makes them foreigners in the underwater world. Most humans only dare venture into their world with the protection of technology. But what if sheer will made a completely new experience of the underwater world possible? If man forgets about his fear of the deep, where are his limits? The realm of the deep. A world that still harbors astonishing untold secrets in its blue depths, leaving humans filled with amazement.
the Earth, a blue planet. 71% of the globe is covered by water. The heartbeat of the Earth is felt by many living things around the globe. Its ebb and flow. The Mediterranean, it has shared its riches with people for thousands of years. However, there are only a few places where a diversity of species has survived. To save them, natural reserves were created like here at the island of Porcro. Underwater, the visitor is confronted with a myriad of different landscapes. Rocky mountains are dissected by light valleys covered with seagrass. The free diver, Frederick Bui, lives and works here. He is an underwater photographer. The exceptional diver can remain more than five minutes underwater without disturbing the fish with the noise made by a pressurized air tank. The Mediterranean Sea is the home to mysterious places and scenes of past tragedies. Wrecks of sunken ships. The sense of mystery and danger surrounds them. The donator was a freighter that hit a mine and sank after the end of World War II. The huge wreck lies between the island of Porcarol and Porcro. The current between the islands creates a spectacular abundance of life. The donator lies at a depth of 50 meters. This dive is a serious challenge for the free divers. Just to get here and back, they have to cover over 100 meters on a single breath. The remains of this dead ship are teeming with life. It seems that nature has conquered the barren bleakness of human technology and turned it into a true paradise. The colors revealed by the spotlights are incredible. Once at the wreck, they have to be careful to conserve energy to avoid a potential blackout on the way back. Reefs are like underwater islands in the blue expanse of the ocean. They offer shelter and food for all kinds of underwater creatures. Underwater peace and quiet prevails. But the wreck attracts divers in droves. Everything changes dramatically. The exhaled bubbles from all these divers now dominates the wreck. The fish retreat. 
Thanks to modern technology, more and more people dare to venture into ever greater depths without sufficient experience. This is quite dangerous since a problem at a depth of 50 meters can quickly become perilous. Underwater mass tourism. For Fred, there is nothing left to see here. The exceptional diver has met many challenges already. However, Frederick Bui has one of his biggest adventures ever in store in the Mediterranean. His destination? Underwater caves at the coast with a very sensitive ecosystem. The researchers have to consider that no breathing air from compressed air bottles should gather in the caves. So the freediver's sensitive and unobtrusive technique is ideal. This is a world that puts high demands on the abilities of the free divers. The entrance alone lies 20 meters below the surface. It is impossible to resurface right in the middle of the cave. William Winram, Frederick Bui's friend and also one of the world's best free divers, will come along and film him on this adventure. To survive such a dangerous undertaking requires supreme ability, self-control, and fitness. It is nothing for the faint-hearted. Whoever thinks that there is no life in these dark and cold caves is definitely wrong. A few years ago, some sponge organisms in the caves attracted a lot of attention from scientists. It's thought that the sponges contain a certain toxin that could be beneficial in the treatment of illnesses like cancer and AIDS. High time to return. Getting stressed here could be fatal. Some free divers are able to reach the incredible depths of over 200 meters in the open ocean and stay underwater for over seven minutes. But these are record-breaking dives. This incredible ability is a result of extreme physical training and incredible self-control to overcome the breathing reflex. Mission completed. The divers safely reached the boat after more than five minutes.
The next destination is waiting more than 16,000 kilometers away. Morea is one of the Society Islands. More precisely, it's one of the Windward Islands. Its bigger neighbor is Tahiti. It is located right in the heart of the conservation area for marine mammals that was established in 2002. With green volcanic peaks that provide an unrivaled view of the surrounding ocean, Morea is an island that captures the essence of a tropical idol. The bright turquoise bays with their deep, clear waters are lined with a protective fringe reef that reaches right around the island. Fred visits Dr. Michael Poole, He's the director of the Marine Mammal Research Program at the Island Research Center and Environmental Observatory. He's heard about this extraordinary marine photographer and wants to cooperate with Fred. Dr. Poole was one of the driving forces behind the setup of the Whale and Dolphin Sanctuary. Dr. Poole doesn't usually work with divers. Hello, one o'clock. He tends to watch and identify the animals from the surface. Humpback whales have completely individual tail fins, distinct both in shape and in coloration. Occasionally, the whales give spectacular, even acrobatic performances. up from the water and thrash the surface with their tail fins. These may be attempts to rid themselves of irritating parasites. The frantic spectacle means that fragments of whale skin come loose, which the scientists quickly gather from the water. It lets them analyze the animal's DNA. Over time, they can piece together an increasingly detailed description of each individual. Now they're in luck. They spot a whale cow with her calf. They seem to be resting near the surface. Fred gets ready. Free divers are always quick to prepare for their dives. Fred always makes the first exploratory dive on his own. This time, luck is on their side. The whale calf is not at all shy, even playful, while its mother is having a rest further down.
The whale mother keeps still in the deep. Looking towards the surface, she keeps an eye on her baby, still being very curious and playful. It's a one-off chance for a close encounter. A meeting of two divers from the human and the animal kingdom. Time to say goodbye. The mother eventually intervenes and the two majestic marine mammals move on. Photographs like these can only be taken underwater. They're a very welcome addition to the whale researcher's catalog. That's really pretty, Fred. I mean, from an aesthetic viewpoint, it's absolutely yeah. beautiful. Nice marks. Yes. And look how these throat plates bifurcate. Can you go backwards just a second? Right here, splitting into two. Indeed, allowing more spread, more expansion as it takes in water and food. Very, very nice. These detailed photographs of the whale's unique markings are invaluable to Dr. Poole's research. Working from the boat, he would normally be unable to take any pictures as detailed as these. We can actually identify whales, not only by their tails, not only by their dorsal fins, we can identify them by their cleats. 
They are different for every individual. Great photograph, Fred. Yeah, truly, really nice. But let's see if we can sex the individual. Every island in French Polynesia offers a unique world. Morea, with its mountains and crevices, is a complete opposite to the flat atolls only 400 kilometers away. But they all have one thing in common. Turquoise bays harbor brilliant coral reefs, and the sea forms a major part of life for the local people. A very special place on Rangiora, the Blue Lagoon. It is a protected area. The palm trees on the beaches are home to a rich variety of bird species. It includes a number of terns like blue and black noddies. Even the violet lorikeet, which has vanished from the majority of South Pacific islands, still survives here. Fred is heading towards the Blue Lagoon, a remote and very special place. The Blue Lagoon is also a nursery for sharks. Young sharks need protection against strong currents and large predator fish, which could be a danger here at the atoll. The lagoon is difficult to reach. In this sheltered bay, the sharks have little to fear and grow up in relative safety. There are only a few places left on Earth where animals are left in peace from tourists and protected from hunters. The blue lagoon of Rangiora is one of them. Plans to build hotels and tourist resorts were thankfully never put into action. These juveniles, lemon sharks and black tip reef sharks, will stay in the shallows, free from predators including their own relatives, until they're big enough to fend for themselves. French scientist Johann Murier tries to find out more about the life cycle of sharks. Johann puts out nets to examine the young sharks in more detail. Fred can film the small sharks at his leisure. At birth, these sharks are around 60 centimeters long, but by the time they reach adulthood, they'll have grown to around 3.5 meters. So I will just need help to carry the shark. We have here, look, we have the umbilical, umbilical scar. So it's a new individual, just born like a month ago. Okay. Will, can you grab it? What? for you and we do a gentle something. Okay. Yeah. We do it out of the water. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's a uh, 69 uh, uh. centimeter. Now I will take a giant example. Taking it from here, from the tail. 
big mouth. Yeah. Relative to their little body, yeah. Oh, shit. Okay. Yeah. Oh, he's okay. Don't worry. Attends, tu peux le refaire. Enfin, c'est un coup mais juste. I put the the sample in the alcohol to for future genetic analysis, so to extract the DNA, so it can uh, just take it for a long time. Okay. Okay. We can, can let, let him go. go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mais va, mon ami. That's what you want to. It's beautiful. It's yeah. like uh, the, the the big one, but uh, in small. Huh? It's, uh, yeah, really look like the beautiful real thing. little creatures. <laughs> Their eyes are amazing. Adult lemon sharks are only found outside the bays, beyond the coral ring. Together with his friend William Winram, Fred helps the scientists in his research of the lemon sharks. Lemon sharks are impressive animals. They're among the biggest sharks in the ocean. Grown animals look scary, but so far there has been no known fatal accident. In typical shark fashion, lemon sharks are equipped with rows of teeth that can be replaced repeatedly. Some sharks lose 30,000 or more teeth in their lifetime. Other kinds of shark are also inquisitive and approach the divers. They are gray reef sharks and black tip sharks that have become curious as well. The distinctive second dorsal fin is conspicuously large. The free divers want to attach transmitters to the sharks in order to gain more information on their territoriality. The marine biologist hopes that they come closer than he can with his noisy diving equipment. The diver's work starts with trying to get the animals used to their presence. Lemon sharks have very few natural enemies. The only threat comes from a select few other shark species, or, chillingly, their own kind. Lemon sharks tend to hunt all sorts of fish, including smaller sharks and even juveniles of their own kind. But stingrays, crustaceans, octopuses, and squid are also on their menu. But although the free divers can get close to the animals, the real test is to get the right angle for a successful shot near the back fin. Johan checks the receiver. It records if the transmitter on the shark is nearby. Only a calmly swimming shark can be harpooned with precision. Frightened animals will quickly disappear, or worse, aggressive animals could launch an attack. Since shark skin is unusually tough, the harpoon has to be fired from point-blank range to penetrate. It's quite a tall order. The transmitter is well placed. Johan documents the tag. Fred has reloaded the harpoon and is ready for another attempt. He's in luck. A big female makes for an ideal target.
This transmitter is also secure and well placed. In the next few years, the researchers will find out where the lemon sharks spend their time, if they have a preference for certain locations, or if they spend their time spread out right around the atoll. Johan passes the next transmitter to Fred. The mission is complete. It's been an all-around success. The passages through the Ring of Coral Reef are especially significant for the ecological system of the reefs. The current through the coral reefs makes them vital passages. This is the territory of the gray reef shark that lives here in large groups. Divers have to remain vigilant. Other sharks are ready and waiting. Gray reef sharks. Reef sharks are generally curious, but not aggressive towards people. And in contrast to many types of sharks, they are still relatively common. Although Fred and Will are surrounded by sharks, they remain calm. Their controlled movements and noiseless presence means the sharks are relaxed and allow them to stay nearby. Growing to a length of about 2.5 meters, they can dive to an impressive depth of around 300 meters in pursuit of prey. These sharks are not just hunters, they're also prey, and their predators include the great hammerhead. Perhaps their presence means that the team has a good chance of finding the hammerheads. Where the passage opens towards the sea is the habitat of the large shark species. The lemon shark, the tiger shark, the big hammerhead shark, and the silver tip shark. Silver tip sharks are easily distinguished by their lightly colored fin tips. While the gray reef sharks always stay near the coral atoll, these bigger silver tip sharks often venture further into the open sea. Fred and Will make sure never to turn their backs to the predators. As long as they can maintain eye contact and don't give the sharks a chance to launch a surprise attack, they're safe. It is certainly a lot easier to observe these sharks since they are very curious and approach the divers. There are various theories as to what is happening here. Either the jacks try to herd the sharks out of their territory or they are cleaning themselves by rubbing against their rough skin. Possibly, they also hunt together with the sharks. The 
sharks want to find out if it might be worth launching an attack, and they invest a lot of time to weigh up the situation. They're not known to be aggressive towards humans, but down here, nothing can be taken for granted. The sharks do keep a very wary eye on Fred and Will. Two great hammerhead sharks were sighted here, at the coast of Rangiroa. Fred and Will don't want to miss the opportunity to watch such a rare animal. However, their chances are not good. It's not the diver who finds the hammerhead, but the shark who finds the diver. The diver tries to remain as inconspicuous as possible and waits. This can be a decisive advantage for Fred. No hammerhead shark to be seen. They are solitary hunters, and despite their enormous size, they are very shy. But Fred is lucky. There, in the distance, he spots the contours of a great hammerhead shark. However, the predator keeps his distance. Now, remaining calm is the motto. No movement is to irritate the shark. The great hammerhead shark is an impressive animal. A fully grown hammerhead can reach between three and six meters and weighs up to 500 kilos. These enormous animals are cautious hunters. Usually they quickly disappear after being checked. To follow them makes no sense. The big hammerhead shark is an ocean-going shark covering long distances. Fred remains motionless to see if the animal is going to come any closer. The great hammerhead can be distinguished from other hammerhead species by its very large crescent-shaped first dorsal fin. Science still has no concrete answer to the question of why these sharks have such a bizarre head shape. The researchers want to find out what advantages the hammerhead sharks get from this strange adaptation. An encounter with this hunter in the endless oceans is a great stroke of luck for a diver. In Polynesia, they call the great hammerhead the king of the sharks. Suddenly, another impressive member of the shark family gets near, a tiger shark. And this one is not at all shy. They've been named for their characteristic pattern of dark stripes. They can reach an astonishing length of over five meters. Their size alone commands respect. Since tiger sharks can be really curious, they are not shy around humans. Some of the biggest sharks in the world now gather in the immediate vicinity of the free diver. The hammerhead returns. Some scientists think the head shape provides aerodynamic advantages. 
it could provide greater stability during lightning fast maneuvers in the water. Hammerheads have also been observed using their heads to pin rays to the ground before eating them. The extreme width of their heads could make it easier to receive the electromagnetic signals of their prey. Or perhaps the hammerheads are able to build up three-dimensional impressions of their surroundings through their sense of smell. But all of these theories have yet to be confirmed. It's time for Fred to recover from the strenuous dives at greater depths. But sharks not only live in the deep. White tip sharks are only rarely found in the vicinity of the coastline. They are easily identified because of their high, strongly rounded dorsal fins. These sharks are usually solitary and belong to the few species that can be very dangerous for humans. But adults only rarely come across people since only the juveniles stay within easy reach of the coastline. Pilot fish are often found accompanying these sharks. Fakarava is the second biggest atoll of French Polynesia. Fakarava is a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. It hosts a particularly rich and impressive collection of plants and animals. It's designed to protect species diversity, as well as offering local people a way of living successfully in harmony with nature. That also provides a secure resource base for the future of the islanders. In many ways, these flat islands are anything but ideal for human occupation. Due to the rising of the sea level because of global warming, many inhabitants are afraid for their livelihood. The archipelagos are the remains of former volcanoes. These have long since sunk, and only the coral ring around them has remained. These rifts were the basis for new islands. Black-tip reef sharks are often seen around the coral reefs of the South Pacific. It shouldn't worry divers that they are often found in large numbers. Like many types of sharks, they are quite curious and often approach humans underwater.
Their beautifully patterned dorsal fin often protrudes from the water surface. So-called shark suckers use the sharks as a means for transport. Many people count diving on the South Sea's coral reefs as one of the highlights of their lives. Coral reefs are often called the rainforests of the sea. They're part of the most diverse and species-rich habitats on Earth. A reef is essentially a metropolis of the sea. Many fish seek safety in numbers as shoals. Others hide amongst the corals. The sun is important for the reef. Coral polyps live in symbiosis with the tiny algae, which use photosynthesis to turn sunlight into sugar. That's why coral reefs depend on the sun and grow up towards it. They tend to thrive only in light-filled shadows. form the basis of highly complex ecosystems. The reef itself consists of relatively few different corals. There are around 5,000 types of coral in the world compared to 20,000 different types of fish that call the coral reef their home. Despite the serene impression, this is no paradise. Predators roam the reefs, and stiff competition for space and food makes life incredibly tough. Some species are positively rebuilding the reef during their search for food. This yellow margin triggerfish is looking for prey amongst the coral rubble. This wrasse also leaves a trail of destruction behind on its quest for a tasty morsel. A humphead wrasse cruises above the reef. It can grow to a length of more than two meters and weigh about 200 kilograms. It creates even more of a stir when it searches for food among the corals. This parrotfish is one of the most stunning reef fish here. Using its tough beak-like mouth, it works on the corals to get to the algae inside. It swallows big gulps of this algae and coral mixture so that its feces tend to be composed almost entirely of coral sand. The result is that parrotfish are almost exclusively responsible for the sand found on the reefs. For a quiet, free diver, there is a lot to hear. The underwater world is not a quiet world at all, and fish are by no means silent. This blowfish has his mouth cleaned. Hygiene is a big thing here at the reef.
Fred also finds a rare hawksbill turtle nearby. They're usually very shy, but this one doesn't seem to feel threatened by Fred's presence. It is busily looking for food, mainly sponges that live amongst the corals. This trumpet fish is using a grouper as cover to hunt in an area where he could hide only with difficulty. Coral reefs worldwide are especially threatened by the rising temperature of the oceans caused by global warming. This causes the so-called coral bleaching when corals die. If the reefs die, the diversity of species will decrease and complete ecosystems will collapse. Here in Fakarava, we can still admire an intact, complex ecosystem. This trumpet fish is cleverly disguising itself as part of the stingray. Other rays prefer the deep, manta rays. They grow five to nine meters in length. Thus, they are the biggest of their species. They are harmless giants. The majestic manta rays have found a swarm of small larvae which they scoop from the waters. abundance of motifs for a marine photographer. Then the divers receive other visitors, mammals just like themselves, curious and playful in the weightlessness of the ocean they come to investigate the divers. Dolphins are essentially perfectly adapted free divers. They can hold their breath for up to 15 minutes and reach incredible depths of up to 300 meters. The dolphins of Rangiroa have been used to people for a very long time. They are inquisitive and keep only a very small safety distance to the divers. Humans have always been fascinated with the dolphin's playful group behavior and curious nature. And while many shark species also prey on their own kind, dolphins are very sociable animals. These highly developed and successful predators don't spend all day in pursuit of prey. Dolphins have time to play 
and to enjoy life. For many people, they represent an ideal lifestyle, free and full of a love for life. They decide how long they want to spend time with people. Then they vanish again in the wide expanses of their underwater home. A group of barracuda patrols the cliff edges. Just like sharks, they have a fearsome reputation for humans, but reports of actual attacks are few and far between. Yet they are imposing fish, reaching lengths of up to two meters equipped with a set of sharp-edged, fang-like teeth. Young barracuda are often found in large groups in open water, but adults tend to be loners. provides shelter for a large variety of inhabitants with special living conditions. In contrast to other shark species that have to be in constant motion for water to run through their gills, enabling them to breathe, white-tip reef sharks are able to pump water to their gills while resting on the seafloor. Fred can watch a sucker fish cleaning the gills of the shark at close range. saying goodbye to the South Sea's coral reefs. However, the biggest and most dangerous adventure still lies ahead for Fred. The island of Guadalupe, 250 kilometers from the Mexican mainland, isolated in the open sea. It takes at least a day to reach it by boat. The seabed plunges to a depth of about one and a half kilometers here in front of the coast. The island can be reached by ship in half a day from Mexico, if the weather is fair. The team is supported by Pierre Frola from Monaco, a former freediving world champion as well. Lying at anchor well protected in the northern bay, the expedition ship gently sways in the swell. The Mexican marine biologist, Dr. Mauricio Hoyos, is waiting impatiently for the divers to arrive. For five months a year, he is based on the island to conduct his field research. Hi, Fred. How are you? Fine, you? How was the trip? Good, huh? Good condition, flat sea, no waves. 
comfortable. I saw the one with the transmitter yeah. and uh, a white spot. This will be yeah. an exceptional okay. challenge for the divers. I think that somebody saw that female in the other boat yesterday. They told me that it's huge. Oh, Mauricio it's, 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 Hoyos like, says that a white shark like was sighted. The okay. They saw the, they, they saw the saw shark from the, the... No, they saw it from the submersible cage. Uh -huh. They have pictures and it's really, it's big. really big. It's the first time ever that humans try to dive with the giants of Guadalupe. The divers will not be protected by a safety cage. Their only protection, years of experience and incredible self-control. No one knows exactly what will happen once the three free divers are in the water. Christian Petron readies his camera. If you are diving, you have to hold your breath because if you if you uh, emit these bubbles, the shark is going to go away. When we were diving yesterday, and the shark was uh, really close to us, but when it heard the, the bubbles, it was away from us. We wanted to take pictures, but we couldn't because we were going off with the bubbles. But with this, with free diving, it's perfect because no sound. So I think that the shark doesn't feel like uh, threatened. The three free divers work together. Each one covers the back of another. Should any sharks materialize, they don't want to be taken by surprise. Should they swim far below them? tries to arouse the shark's curiosity with noise. Suddenly, they catch a glimpse of movement far below. The shadow doesn't approach them. William decides to turn the tables on the shark and approaches it. How will the predator react? But the shark doesn't accept the challenge. Once again, he vanishes into the blue of the ocean. The next time they try, the divers can't get anywhere near the shark. This killer could make short work of each of the divers with just a single bite, but it cautiously stays away. He decides how close they can come. There are no signs of aggression, but he also shows no fear. Against all expectations, this first shark encounter has exposed the great whites as cautious, even shy animals. The elements of wind and water have dug deep furrows into the face of Guadalupe. As inhospitable as this isolated island may seem, for some creatures, it is paradise and a safe haven. Northern elephant seals enjoy the seclusion it has saved them from certain extermination 
at the hands of greedy hunters. At the beginning of the last century, they were already considered extinct. They were hunted because of the oil extracted from their fat. Elephant seals are the biggest seals in the world. Despite their ungainly appearance on land, they are adept underwater acrobats and hunters, able to pursue fish and octopuses down to an astonishing depth of 600 meters. But out in the open ocean, hunters can quickly become the hunted. This seal has been the recent victim of a vicious attack, a shark attack. Blood traces show where the injured animal returned to land. But it will survive. They're not entirely without protection in the water. Bulls can grow to more than four meters and weigh in at up to two and a half tons. No easy prey for a white shark. Their blubber acts like a shield, not only against the cold, but also against the jagged teeth of the great white shark. The island is also home to other rare inhabitants. This is where the Guadalupe fur seals live. They are the rarest of the southern fur seals and strictly protected. They have narrowly escaped extermination and were also already considered extinct. But in the security of the rugged, rocky coastline, a few managed to survive. Once underwater, the inhabitants of Guadalupe are in their real element. The cautious, light-colored elephant seals and the curious, dark fur seals have visitors. The elephant seals tackle the encounter with the divers slowly. They use the cliffs as protection. Good news. The population of elephant seals is growing continuously, so the northern elephant seal is not seriously endangered any longer. Fur seals are phenomenal swimmers. They show no fear and approach the divers at close range. The team are probably the first humans they've come face to face with for a very long time. Perhaps they see the divers as animals similar to themselves, and they wouldn't be far wrong. Guadalupe fur seals have incredibly large eyes, which allow them to have excellent eyesight below water. Seals have a torpedo-shaped body, it is perfectly adapted to a life in the water. Its characteristics make the seals more aerodynamic, the perfect shape for phenomenal divers and swimmers. of Guadalupe is a strictly protected nature reserve. So the colony was able to recover. Today, no one is allowed to hunt elephant seals and fur seals, except the white shark. 
the giant predators patrol outside the bays with fur seal colonies. Here, the divers have the best chance to meet the sharks. As always when hunting, patience is the main thing. Or will a trick be the solution? Pierre tries to arouse the shark's curiosity. Perhaps splashing on the water surface could guide the sharks to them. Something ordinary swimmers and divers should avoid in shark-infested waters at all costs. Will the shark hear him? And here he comes, accompanied by a fur seal who, like the divers, is not afraid of the giant. Divers don't want to wait at the surface. Just one of the free divers will try to approach while the others watch his back. The cautious tactic pays off. Gradually, the sharks appear to be getting used to the divers. They become increasingly curious about the visitors. But the divers have to remain vigilant. The shark right in front of them isn't always the only shark around. William, William, right behind you. Will has a lucky escape. Out here, just one moment of unwariness could cost a diver his life. The shark's behavior reveals their increasing curiosity, but also that they don't want to take any risks in attacking any unknown opponent spontaneously. Only watching them without prejudice allows one to look at them without fear. Again and again, the sharks turn away only at the last moment. The eye contact is important. A shark wants to attack suddenly. He will wait as long as he feels watched. Gradually, the divers manage to get extremely close to the sharks. They take pictures of those impressive animals from all sides, point blank.
a long time, it had been assumed that the sharks spend most of their time in coastal waters to hunt sea lions and seals. But with the help of high-tech satellite transmitters, it has become clear that they undertake incredible journeys of several thousand kilometers. During these long-distance migrations, they tend to stay at depths of 300 or 500 meters. But so far, scientists have only been able to observe them near the water surface. The rest of the sharks' lives remains a mystery. A break for the divers. Time to consider the exciting experiences. I was uh, taking the opportunity to come from under. And uh, because you don't see it coming from under. So it's really coming at you and doesn't stop, doesn't stop. At like 50, 60 centimeters from you, turns. It's really nice. Very nice. Mauricio has installed receivers near seal colonies in three bays around Guadalupe. When a shark fitted with one of his radio transmitters approaches, they register the signal. Mauricio hopes this data will support his theory that big females are the most prolific seal hunters since they need the extra energy provided by the seal blubber. However, to do so, the transmitters must be attached to the sharks. The divers will undertake this task. The transmitters are attached near the back fin using barbed hooks. Fred, Will, and Pierre carefully prep the string that attaches the transmitter to the barb. The transmitters are very expensive, and losing any would mean a serious blow to the entire project. To penetrate the tough shark skin, they have to be shot from a harpoon. The last and most important dive begins. The crew takes the same approach as before and allows the sharks to get used to them in the water first. is for Will to take a photograph before Pierre tries to tag the first shark. Everything is going according to plan. Pierre manages to get into an ideal position to shoot his harpoon, but then he hesitates. The chance passes. Fred explains what happened. There's one shark with, uh, like, tags. But like, uh, it's not acoustic side of stuff. No, but uh, with, with parasites? Yes. Yeah. yeah the, maybe it's uh, the feather, it, it was from a satellite transmitter. Uh -huh. So now it, it has just the, the parasites, I think. So uh, you want us to tag that one? Yes, if, if, you, are, if yeah. you are sure that it's not an acoustic, it's not an acoustic, right? Oh, yeah. We will we can be sure, but it doesn't seem to be an acoustic. Maybe it's, maybe it's just the feather with yes. the parasites. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Again, the divers try to reach the ideal shooting position. But Pierre realizes the danger. Will is right in front of the shark. If the shark gets aggressive, Will would be extremely vulnerable. Pierre has to let the shark go a second time. But an experienced hunter knows, patience is at the top of the list. The divers take their time. Perhaps the shark has noticed some tension among the team. Perhaps the long and unfamiliar harpoons have spooked him. He is very cautious. Then Pierre has another chance. It's a good hit, but the hook didn't bite. The transmitter drops along the line into the depths. The shark has been spooked for good and disappears. Will has found another target and prepares to shoot while Pierre retrieves his transmitter.
Will takes a shot, but the angle is not ideal. The line doesn't release with the transmitter. The shark is getting nervous. Finally, the line loosens and the shark can swim away. But Will is lucky. A nervous, aggressive shark is unpredictable. This could have ended very badly. But the transmitter is fixed and well placed. Now everything goes smoothly and the team manages to tag two large females. Did you tag it? Yes. The big female? The big one. Excellent. It's a yeah. female, right? Huh? It's a female. Oh yeah, it's huge. Excellent. Well, the other tag. We have photos. Left and right. Perfect. Oh, the other shark is She's not there, she's back. Hey, so Can you take a picture with the transmitter on it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. William yeah. has a uh, uh, video, okay. and now I'm back to take pictures. This shot was perfect. The transmitter is securely in place and releases the line immediately. Mauricio is more than satisfied. Yes, of course. It's a big female. And I think that they are feeding on the seals, the big females. I have seen a lot of females feeding on seals, so this is perfect for the, for the array that I said uh, a few days ago. It's been an exceptional accomplishment. Getting any closer than this to great white sharks in their own element is virtually impossible. comes to an end. You can really explain to the people they are nice animals because all the picture you see of great white sharks and the film, it's always with the mouth open going at the camera. But you have to know it. if they do that, it's because you had a lot of blood and bait in the water, yeah. sometimes even uh, bait on the camera or on the cage. So they <coughs> go there and uh, yeah, to, yeah, to yeah. have like kind of spectacular images. Really yeah. But when they don't have bait, they're just curious. They want to see what we are and they stay for 15, 20 minutes, yeah. then they are gone, but yeah, they never really open the jaws. The only time where I was a little bit worried is uh, when uh, William tagging the shark, when I saw the shark, I, I see, oh my God, he take in the passage. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, oof, he's gone. But uh, it's only time I was very worried because the shark was shy. Humans have to take care about sea life and the watermen we are have to show that the shark is not dangerous. He's curious and he lives in the sea. He's this place, so we have to respect that. We are just visitors. Yeah.